and a warm welcome to the first children and young people scrutiny panel of this municipal year. Um, I'm glad to see lots of familiar faces back on the panel, um, along with a couple of uh, new faces. Um, my name is Councillor Osama Kawesa, and I'm pleased to be continuing in this role as chair. Now, before we progress with tonight's agenda, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the newest member to our panel, uh, Maraki, um, who of course is also one of our young inspectors. Um, we're really happy to have you join us and we're all looking forward to your questions, uh, your insights and uh, your, your contributions to all the services we scrutinize. Uh, but of course, no pressure, uh, just when you feel like contributing. Um, and as this is uh, your first CYP panel, and there's been uh, a few changes uh, in the leadership of the Children, Lifelong Learning and Families Department, um, I think it will be helpful to just do a quick round of introductions uh, before we then uh, progress with the agenda. Um, I'll hold off on the speakers introducing themselves because we'll do that when we get to your agenda items. Um, but if all other panel members uh, could introduce themselves, uh, that would be great. Uh, should we start with those in the chamber? Uh, let's start from the back there. Yes. Hi, I'm Samantha MacArthur, Councillor for Wimbledon Park Ward. Hello, Councillor Jennifer Gould, Cannon Hill Ward. Hello, I'm Councillor Caroline Charles from Ravensbury Ward. Hello, I'm Councillor James Williscroft from Lower Morden Ward. Hello, I'm Billy Hayes from Councillor Councillor Billy Hayes from Gravney Ward. Hi, I'm Linda Kirby, Councillor for Gravney Ward as well. Um, and could we also have the officers introduce themselves, please? Apologies, Beth Fitzpatrick, Assistant Director for Education and Early Help. Uh, Jane McSherry, um, Executive Director for Children, Lifelong Learning and Families. Toby Podger Taylor, Participation and Engagement Worker in Children, Lifelong Learning and Families. Hello, my name is Maraki, and I am one of the young inspector within Participation and Engagement. Thank you. Good evening. I'm David Michael. I'm the Interim Assistant Director of Children's Social Care and Youth Inclusion. Hi, I'm Maisie Davis. I'm Head of Performance Improvement and Partnerships in Children, Lifelong Learning and Families. And uh, Councillor Kenny. Sorry, Chair. Um, Councillor Sally Kenny, Lower Morden Ward and Cabinet Member for Education and Lifelong Learning. And could I just get the members? Sorry. Yeah, I'll have them introduce themselves when we get to the agenda item. Yes. Um, could, could I also have the, the members uh, who are online quickly introduce themselves as well? Hello, good evening. This is Mansoor Ahmad, corporate government, go, corporate member, governor, parents, governor, regards Lodge School. And I'm Ros Cordner. Good evening. A co opted member representing the Church of England. Hi, Becky Cruz, co opted member and vice chair of a local primary school. Uh, Councillor Michael Butcher, Cricket Green Ward. Okay, um, <clears throat> um, thank you very much for introducing yourselves. Um, and as I've said before, we'll introduce our guest speakers when we get to that agenda item. Um, and can I also once more uh, express my gratitude uh, to each and every one of you for your continued service on what I regard to be one of our most uh, important panels. Uh, when I first chaired this panel, uh, I said that I wanted this space to be for learning, 
uh, for challenging and offering uh, constructive feedback and for making any recommendations where we saw gaps. And those are still my guiding principles uh, in this role. And can I also remind members uh, to always be mindful that the work that we do here will help to shape services uh, for the children and young people uh, in our borough, and in some cases, even determine uh, their life chances uh, for years to come. And so we owe it to them to deliver in our role to the best of our ability. Um, and uh, as long as I chair um, this panel, that's the standard that I would hold myself to um, and panel members as well. And I very much look forward to this uh, municipal year. And with that said, uh, let, let us proceed uh, into the agenda. Uh, we've got quite a few reports to cover this evening, um, starting off with the Healthy Child Services update, um, and then an update on childhood immunizations in the borough. Um, and in a moment, I will hand over to um, our guest speakers who uh, we're pleased to have with us tonight uh, so that they can introduce the report and take any questions. Um, and then we'll move on to the departmental updates um, and also reflect on the findings and recommendations uh, from one of our task groups, um, ending the evening with an agreement on the new work program. Um, so it is a packed schedule. Um, and so let's get on with agenda item one. Uh, any apologies of absence? Um, I have received uh, one apology for absence from Councillor Flack, uh, who's uh, replaced in the chamber by Councillor Gould. Uh, so welcome to welcome back to CYP, because I know you've uh, been to a previous uh, panel. And uh, Councillor Butcher is tuning in online. Um, so those are the only uh, apologies. Um, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? No. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item three. Um, are the minutes of the previous meeting agreed as a true and accurate account of that meeting? Brilliant. Okay. Um, then let's move on to our first proper agenda item, uh, the Healthy Child Services uh, Update uh, Report. And with that, uh, I'll hand over to Helena. Uh, and her colleagues uh, to introduce the report um, into the 0 to 19 uh, Healthy Child Services commissioned by Public Health. Um, and Thank if you can also fully introduce yourselves, uh, that would be great as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm Helena Asras. I'm Head of Public Health Services for Children, Young People and Sexual Health within the Public Health team at Merton Council. And I will hand over to my colleague Julia to introduce herself but also our colleagues from Frontier Watch. Hello I'm, I'm Julia Groom and I'm a consultant in public health with the public health team and have overall lead for children and young people as well as sexual health and, and healthy place. Thank you. Hi everyone my name is Hannah Eladuni. I'm a Merton 0 to 19 clinical lead. I'm employed by Central London Community Healthcare so I'm from health. Um, my background's a midwife and I'm here representing health visiting and school nursing and other services for zero to 19 in Merton. I am Shelley Heffernan. I'm head of clinical services here in Merton um, and that's for Central London Community Healthcare. And we provide, as Hannan said, health visiting and school nursing as well as therapy services here in Merton. Thank you. And I'm a health visitor by background. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through just a brief overview of the, the paper. Um, so we were we really welcomed the opportunity to bring our 0 to 90 Healthy Child Program services here to this committee. I think previously we have um, provided some updates as part of wider and bigger uh, reports, um, but really we welcome the, the committee's request to have this on the agenda and um, opportunity to um, share kind of learning and um, and challenge and feedback as you as you said chair so really welcome that. Um, so just in terms of the the overview of the the paper and um, our services so it keeps um, cutting out I hope that's okay. 
Um, so our, the the paper, sorry, the services, our 0 19 services are um, commissioned by public health and deliver health visiting school nursing services and also a young parents uh, support program and are delivered by our colleagues in central London Community Healthcare NHS Trust. And these services support our families, our children and families up to the age of 19, but also go up to 25 where there are um, children are looked after or have uh, additional needs. So the services work to the national um, framework, which is called the Healthy Child Program Framework, and this is an evidence-based uh, program, and all areas in the country uh, deliver this and are kind of mandated to, to deliver this. Um, and it has a number of uh, mandated uh, checks um, as part of the services. So the model is universal in, in its reach, so it reaches all of our kind of um, young people under the age of uh, five or up to the age of, uh, sorry, universally the health visiting services um, deliver up to the age of five and our school nursing services deliver up to the age of um, 19 and then up to 25 with um, additional needs or vulnerabilities. So the council through the director of public health has a statutory duty um, in relation to delivery of these 0 to 19 healthy child services and these mandated um, services. Our services are delivered by specialist public health nurses or led by specialist public health nurses, uh, sometimes referred to as SCIFN, um, within a kind of a skill mix of uh, staff that, that support the delivery of that. Um, 3.1.7 goes into the detail of those mandated checks. Um, so these are universally offered and available to, to families uh, in, in Merton. Um, I won't go into all the, the, the details of it, but just kind of re making reference to it so that you have it there in your, your papers. Um, and from a kind of a Merton perspective and based on the needs of our um, community and the needs of our children and families, we have developed more specialised roles within our services. Um, and these are listed in 3.1.11. And these relate to delivery of high impact areas. So these are areas which we know if we... Um, intervene in these areas, they will make a significant impact to the outcomes and the lives of the families as they as the children as they they grow. Um, and so those are listed on 3.1.11. Uh, 3.1.13 refers to um, a confidential appendices that members would have had in their packs. Um, the first one uh, to the McKay study, so the first one is a young 18-year-old parent um, that was supported by uh, our Young Parent Support Services, which is a quite a, a unique uh, service within our, in Merton. Um, and the second case study is um, a family that was seeking asylum um, and was supported by, by the service. And it has a, a nice kind of element of the, the young people's voice, sorry, the family's voice um written you know um verbatim from um the feedback that the services have have had directly and and we're happy to answer any kind of questions on on the case studies as well although they were um confidentially sent to members we're happy to discuss them and we have the consent of the families to to discuss them here today um, 3.1.14 talks about the school nursing services and the mandated elements of the school nursing service is the National Child Measurement Programme, um, which um, the service measures the height and the weight of all four and five year olds in the borough and all um, 10 to 11 year olds in the borough. So that's year sixes. And that gives us the um, kind of the body mass index and shows us what our obesity levels are within the borough and that that supports us with how we deliver interventions to support families um, in Merton. Uh, I think I talked a little bit about the young parent support already but the case study is also there. Um, 3.1.20 uh, talks about how our services really contribute to safeguarding and for those that have additional needs, um, and they make a large contribution to, to safeguarding and, and supporting children with additional needs. I won't go into all of that, the detail, but they also um, benefit from leadership and clinical skills of CLCH's safeguarding and specialist therapy leads who also um, support delivery of these, uh, these services. 
Um, 3.2 goes on to um, a rapid high level review and the, the, the outcomes from, from uh, the rapid review that was undertaken in Merton in, in July uh, last year. Um, which shows the recognize that our stakeholders, our schools, our um, voluntary sector, our, uh, within the council, council services really value the expertise and the work of, of our, our teams. Um, but also later on, it talks about some of the, the challenges um, that, and some of these are national challenges, for example, shortage of um, health visitors and school nurses, which the services are kind of managing as, as, as best as they can and trying to attract um, the best talent to, to work in Merton and making it a really good place to work um, because, uh, yeah, health visitors and school nurses are uh, few and far, far between. We don't have enough. Um, but also, you know, other areas for, for service improvements um, and also to guide our future commissioning of these services. Um, in terms of performance, so that, that starts on 3.3, I just wanted to highlight that um, before the pandemic, uh, Merton services were performing better or similar to kind of London averages, so they were doing really well. Um, however, post pandemic and not just a Merton issue, but, but services are trying to uh, come back um, to recover to pre pandemic levels. So you will see the comparison in table one of uh, pre COVID uptake of some of our mandated checks and the latest data, which is 21, 22, um, which shows lower performance than, than pre COVID. Um, and then it's just in terms of going on to the kind of next step. So our contracts with CLCH have been extended by cabinet approval until uh, March 2025. Uh, between now and then, we will work with our um, NHS colleagues and procurement uh, legal finance uh, colleagues to procure a new service to start in April 2025. Um, so that there, there, there will be a lot of work um, around that and, and the service review and, and other things will, will support that. Um, but throughout the existing contract, we continue to work with um, CLCH in terms of monitoring and improving um, service performance and outcomes. So I, I will stop there. Um, so I've probably gone on a little bit too long, um, but very happy to, to answer any questions uh, between myself and my, my colleagues. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything more to what I've said so far, or should we just go to questions? Um, thank you, Helena. Um, that overview was very useful. And also the report was quite comprehensive as well. Um, and so thank you for sending that over in advance. Um, we'll move straight to questions. Um, as usual, I'll take questions in freeze. Um, I will first check whether there are any questions from our members online before I go to members in the chamber. No? Okay, uh, we'll move to members in the chamber. Um, we'll start off with um, Councillor uh, Kirby and then... Um, uh, Councillor uh, Hayes and then Councillor MacArthur for this first round of questions. I thought it was a really good report, but thank you very much. Very interesting reading. Um, I'm just one to, this, my question is really around um, obesity um, because I was a Senko for quite a number of years in a school in Wandsworth and we had a child there who was almost square in year two, he was really, really big. And it was a very difficult process trying to deal with that issue. And I would be, and we, and we ended up going to boot camp, but actually when you went into detail of what was going on at home, the cupboards were locked because he was aggressively trying to get food. It was horrific really, but also the whole family were large. So it wasn't just about this child. So I'd be really interested to know I mean, you've got stats in there about, uh, the, you know, the involvement around un under eating and overeating. But can I ask, um, you know, what, what would be the procedure when you are dealing with children who uh, are obese? Is it just collecting stats or are you actually doing more than that? Yeah. Hi, thanks for the verbal update, and obviously the raw report as well, and as Councillor Kirby says, uh, is excellent. But the, the bit, and this is apologies for my age in asking this question, but um, 
I'm old enough to remember the Nitness. Um, and, you know, it was a terrifying service. Searching for lice and kids there. So it was terrifying for us kids, you know, because it, it was not more shaming than being being pulled to one side and all the rest of it. So I'm not really up to speed on, on where we are on that. One, do we have any equivalent nowadays? I mean, I don't know if lice is... is, is um, is is prevalent, but my my suspicion, because of lockdown, because of um, general rise in poverty, that lice may well be on the increase. And so, do 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 you cover any area with respect to lice? Uh, and if, if you know of any increase in the, uh, lice, I know it makes everyone itchy when you talk about lice. But but if you anything on that, please. Thank you very much for the report. Um, I noticed that there, it says there are five mandated reviews which should be un offered universally, and one of them is the antenatal one, um, which they say Merton doesn't offer. Um, it's targeted, and then you have other targeted uh, resources. I just wondered why that decision had been made, and if you'd looked at the implications and assessed how that worked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just on the first question around obesity, uh, maybe if I start and then colleagues can can add in, um, just in terms of, I suppose, strategically, um, childhood obesity is a big priority for the council in terms of the um, uh, from the health and wellbeing board. And there are um, there is a child healthy weight steering group of a number of kind of uh, partners working in the borough to support how we can um, as well as kind of the individual support, which um, colleagues will talk about, it's the wider kind of environmental support that we need to change the environments that we live in and work in to be more supportive of re reducing childhood obesity, whether that's being more physically active in terms of active travel or um, or with, whether that's around eating healthily. So, so there is a big kind of program of, of work around that um, with regular meetings and, and partners come together. There's a number of programs that, that sit on that. Um, in terms of the, the school nursing and national child measurement program, that's where we get our stats from, um, which are really helpful. Um, but from that, there is um, a family start service, which I'll refer to my colleagues to, to talk a little bit about. Um, but just before that, also, we have commissioned something new, which is uh, Children Young People's Social Prescribing Pilot. It's a pilot for the borough. It's a new service. Um, there's not many other um, commissioned services uh, like this, um, but very few. Um, but this supports um, children with uh, obesity. So where they're identified as obese, there is uh, a process or a referral pathway into this service where they will get one-to-one -one and more kind of detailed support um, around, uh, you know, signposting and supporting them to access a number of different services within the within the borough. So that's relatively new. Um, but the Family Start program, I'll hand over to um, Shelley or Hanan to talk a little bit about that, which the school nursing service deliver. Thanks, Helena. Um, so following from what Helena said, Family Start is delivered by our school nurses. So once the NCMP programme comes to an end, so when the children are weighed and measured, um, which is what Helena referred to earlier on in her presentation, that data then comes back to us and then those families receive a letter and then they are referred on to our specialist Family Start service and that's delivered by a nutritionist and the school nursing. So it's a whole family approach. It's around healthy eating and making healthy choices. And it's about behavioural change because the evidence shows that if families get support around making healthier choices, it's more sustainable. Also, going back to, I think I heard a comment about a young child. Um, I'm not sure who made that. So from September, we will be starting a pilot just looking at children from the age of two to four before they start school because we're picking quite a lot up in reception that are already overweight like you referred to earlier so what we're going to do is start family start for the younger children so before they get to ncmp when they've had the way we're going to identify them is when they've had their two-year health review we do a height and weight at that appointment at two and we're looking at early intervention and prevention 
So we're just going to trial it and see how many children are referred to the service. So we're hoping that will start in September to December. Um, I think for us, it's, it's definitely prevention. So I think you're right. You talked about that child that you went to the school who was where we're seeing a lot more obesity post-COVID. So it's a very real issue. And sometimes it, it does also cut, you know, cross over to the realms of safeguarding as well. So we're having to work really closely with schools, with families to um, make those changes. But we in Merton, we're going like straight from antenatal with our breastfeeding and our healthy nutrition to that we hopefully don't get to that stage. And with our health visiting services, I think you said in the report, we're going for gold in terms of our breastfeeding initiative. So hopefully, she says, with that, then that's obviously going to make a long-term difference. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Is that, is that okay? Is there anything, any follow-up? Okay, thank you. Yeah, great, no, thank you. Um, and just to pick up the, the second question, um, I think I yeah, that. you want to yeah yeah. So um, things have changed with the knit nurse as, as you. I can remember the knit nurse. I think I wasn't one because um, I was a health visitor by background. But I absolutely remember the knit nurse. Um, so as now as health visitors, we're actually trained to prescribe for knit lotions and things like that. That's part of our like additional roles and responsibilities, and for school nurses as well. So we have a much more kind of additional roles and responsibilities when we go into school. In terms of it being more of an issue post-COVID, I think with NITS, it's more seasonal. You get at starts of terms, but we do have cases where children do have recurrent NITS. It's a big issue, um, and you often find there's lots of family issues there. So what we will do is we'll go and visit families at home. We'll provide a bit more of a targeted services, and we'll go and speak to the families and educate them and you know work closely with schools and with social care in terms of trying to solve that, because... A child who keeps having repeated knits, you're absolutely right. It can be a horrible experience for them as well. So I think things have possibly changed, but we keep the good parts. So we do have people identified who can support, but we don't have a specific knit nurse as such. Can, can you tell me whether, any, even if it's anecdotal, is it on the rise, uh, Lise? Not that I'm aware of. No, I think a lot of, we don't collect data. We know when it becomes quite severe because then it can become a safeguarding issue. So we do have cases where it does become a safeguarding issue. Um, but a lot of families will self-medicate and schools are pretty good at getting the, you know, since one child has the NITs, they'll send out the health promotion. And the school nurses will have a role in schools to go in and do health promotion with families and things like that. So, yeah, not that I'm aware of. Thank you. And I think the third question was around the antenatal check. Um, so just in terms of, I'll, I'll refer to my colleagues, um, but just to say the antenatal check, as you said, we have put in the report that it's not um, universal. Um, when we were kind of um, commissioning some of the, the services we wanted to see, it wasn't there before. It wasn't being delivered before. Um, so that was something that we implemented through the commissioning of our, our services to, to try to, to start that uh, and to kind of increase numbers um, as we go. Um, so we're still not there yet in terms of delivering completely universally. Um, but we're obviously making some, some progress. But if you want to go into the detail of how you identify the families and um, deliver those services, especially for the, the ones with additional vulnerabilities. Uh, thanks, Helena. So as Helena said, we do deliver targeted antenatal contacts at home to any family that we've identified with a vulnerability, whether that's previous mental health, known to any services. All of our universal families do receive a welcome letter. And within that letter, there's a link to a video that was made by our staff and our team talking about pregnancy, who we are, the Red Book, how to cope with a crying baby, relationship, and that's all online. So all of our families receive that information, vulnerable or universal, and then our vulnerable families get a face-to-face -face home visit from a health visitor. But just to add in that video, so obviously if we if we um, do an assessment that the family are vulnerable, and that tends to come from our midwifery colleagues or if there's known issues, we'll obviously reach out to them. But our mothers who 
you, we might think a universal can ask for a visit and a contact. So, you know, some some young mums first time around might just want um, input. So we will go and see them then. So it's not just the vulnerable clients, anyone who wants to have that more one to one um, visit or home contact, we will do. Um, we also attend in all of our hospitals um, meetings with our midwives. They're regular. So Hannah, you go up to Epsom and St. Helier and St. George's and Kingston where we yeah. meet regularly to talk about our vulnerable clients. So we've got a good communication coming through. So hopefully we'll know about any issues beforehand. With our young parents um, service, so again, not just for vulnerable, for young families, we'll absolutely go and see them at home as well. So it's not just targeted. It will. It could be anyone who wants a first-time mum, you know, who, who could, could have no additional vulnerabilities, but she's wanting some specific health information or contact and we'll, we will go and see them at home we don't say no if that makes sense sorry <clears throat> sorry can I just follow up so are you aiming to have universal coverage for the antenatal or is it always going to be targeted and people who ask for it um at the moment in terms of the current contract that's how we will continue to do, to deliver in terms of our future contract that will be something that we will try and kind of build in because i suppose we always need to remember the limits of kind of resource and capacity um and balance the kind of um where we need to sometimes target some of our services so um you know antenatally some mothers um sometimes don't want the contact with helpers so their focus is on the midwifery the antenatal aspect of it um so sometimes you know it can be a bit more difficult but i think the important the more important kind of reviews of the new birth visit once the baby is born the six or eight week check one year and two year review other things that we're you know we are a must do for us and we we want to you know put resource into increasing and improving those aspects thank you Okay, um, thank you for those uh, responses. Uh, we'll now open it up to another round of questions. Um, we'll start with you, Councillor Gold, and then Councillor Willis-Croft, and then uh, Councillor Charles. Thank you. 3.1.11, the health visiting service in Merton includes more specialist roles. Uh, looking at infant feeding and specialist clinics, uh, and reported recently was the link to obesity and bottle fed babies. I was very pleased to hear about the Merton intervention here with the uh, lactation consultants and the uh, HB team. Can I ask how successful this service has been? Um, how well advertised it is? And are there any more planned um, clinics to be opened? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Willis-Croft, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I've got uh, two or three short questions. Um, thanks for all your hard work with this. Um, my first question is um, page 12. Um, that uh, No, page 13, 3.2.8. So with regards to the mandated checks, so... I want to know when will the new IT system stop having an impact on performance? That's my first question. With regard to mandated checks, when will the new IT system stop having an impact on performance? My um, second question is uh, also on page 12, 3.2.5, school nurses. Um, are you able to provide data when each school in Merton was last visited by uh, a school nurse. And um, my third question, page 12, 3.2.6. So when exactly did the service assess the vacancy rate for health visitors as being better than in other London authorities? Thank you. Yes, th thank you for your report. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could expand a bit on uh, the specialist school nurse and the, the role that they play, because it sounds a really important and interesting one. So I'd like to find out a bit more about it. Thank you. I know you've ended up with five questions instead of three, but uh, <laughs> I hope you've been keeping track of all of those questions. 
Uh, maybe in, in terms of the breastfeeding question, maybe if I can refer to you, Shelley and Hanan. No. Absolutely. You asked how successful it is. I think Merton is unique. We're the only London borough, correct me if I'm wrong, Hanan, to have this NHL level NHL. within this organisation. We, oh, sorry, we're the only NHS organisation to have this level of expertise in the community. So it is very successful and it's run by um, two clinicians and, and one of them has um, published nationally. She's very well regarded. Um, and looked into lots of different areas of breastfeeding with same sex parents. Um, she has a, you know, she's a very, very good wise skill knowledge. Um, we've also just recently uh, developed an Instagram page for it, for our infant feeding game, which is really innovative. So our clients can link on there, they can book into the clinic and they can get information and, and advice as well. We do this in one of our, it's like our children's centers. We work really closely with um, the children's centre um, at Church Road, and we've done a lot of pub public publicity videos, patient feedback, and we do get a lot of positive feedback of it. So I think it's something that we're quite proud about. You, the question was about where we were opening up more clinics. Was 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 that the question? So we 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 run. How many do we run now? In terms of the specialist clinic, that's one day a week in Church Road Children's Centre, and that is run by a lactation consultant. In the borough? Why? Yeah, so that's the specialist clinic. But breastfeeding, we have a drop-in most days across the whole borough, and it alternates where that's been held. But the specialist clinic, that's run by the lactation consultant. So all mothers are offered. The first point is our breastfeeding drop-in where they will see um, our team of health visitors and our infant feeding lead. If it's more complex, for example, we had a baby with cleft lip and palate, then they were referred on to our specialist clinic and then seen there where they successfully went on to breastfeed. We also had a mum contact us antenatally around, she wasn't able to breastfeed the first time, she was really scared. We referred her to the specialist clinic and she went on to breastfeed successfully and actually made us a lovely video in terms of how that support was amazing and really changed her experience, not only a second pregnancy, but a mother and her attachment and bonding with the second child. Can I just ask a follow-up? Um, just wondering how um, mothers make that initial contact um, from, say, leaving hospital or home birth. Is, is there, I mean, I know a lot of women do struggle with breastfeeding, it's very important. So are they, um, is every woman given the information that their clinic is available? Yeah, so our infant feeding lead works really closely with the local midwifery infant feeding leads. So most maternity units have their own infant feeding lead and we work really closely with them. So those mothers would have our information when they're going home. And then when we call them on the phone, we'll further email them lots of more information about how to access help. It's just one um, number, whether they want to be seen by a health visitor in the infant feeding. So it's just one phone number. Thank you. Um, I think the second question was about the IT system. The, I think it was referring to 3.2.8. Um, and just I suppose mainly that was referring to we were kind of undertaking the the review um, I, the IT issue the change in the, in the IT was having an impact on some of that um, I think we've moved forward from that um, in terms of the the current uh, services so um, I think those issues have been resolved um, on the kind of mandated checks and having an impact on the the mandate checks but Shelley if you want do you have something to yeah, add to that? Absolutely. So we're on EMIS, which is the same system as our local GPs. So it, it, it's a system that wasn't devised. It's devised for um, general practice and for clinic-based services. So it had to be tweaked to um, meet the needs of us because we work in homes and in the community. So we've gone through that process. I think we were one of the, one of the first people to go on to it in terms of children's services so we've done a lot of work so we're actually starting to work for us if that makes sense but whilst the data was an issue which on the system we all we have, we have spreadsheets and manual counts so we we can assure ourselves if you like that we know that what we're doing in terms of our visiting even if we couldn't provide the information from the actual clinical system 
Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the next question was about school nurses and school nurse visits. Yeah, please. So yes, we would be able to provide the data. I think as commissioners, we've been asked and we've had several um, times throughout working with yourselves where you've asked for that data and we keep a the nurses have um, a remit about how many times they need to, to visit either a, a primary school or secondary school. It's different, or one of the, the schools with, um, you know, like where there's children with more additional needs. So um, we would be able to provide that data. And each school nurse has a responsibility to do drop ins, et cetera. And we do provide that back to the commissioners intermittently throughout all our time. So, yes. Uh, I think the next question was about uh, vacancy rates. Um, I think this was during the time of the review, which was last year, um, where the vacancy rate, where this information kind of came from around vacancy rates um, and kind of benchmarking to other areas. But maybe you want to come in on that, Shelley. Yep. So Central London Community Health Care delivers <clears throat> health visiting with the biggest providers of health visiting across London. So we've got internal data. So we know where when we trained about 35 health visitors last year we know where they're going to be placed whether they're in boroughs with us and so therefore we know that a lot of our houses want to come back to Merton we have health visitors who will go to work for another borough and we have quite a few returners so we we can quite um with confidence say that yeah in terms of recruitment there is a smaller pool but we do attract them in Merton and we make a big effort to make sure that we retain them And I think there was there was something around. Um, uh, gosh, what was the last question? The, the, yacht? the yeah. specialist school nurse. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah, do you want to talk about it? It's a new role, so it's quite exciting. Oh. About to talk about it a bit more. Okay, so I can give you a slight overview of the role. The role was developed following the pandemic. We saw an increase in electively homeschooled children, and there were some vulnerable children that were highlighted to social care. Um, and I think there was a need, there was an increase in safeguarding of about 33%. Electively homeschooled children pre-COVID was around 80. Now it's over 200 children are electively homeschooled. So our specialist uh, school nurse covers youth offending service, uh, missing education. So I've got a list because it's quite long. <laughs> bear, bear with me. So youth offending service, pupil referral unit, children miss education, electively homeschooled children and the Mulberry College umbrella. So it's just one school nurse supporting these families um, and young people that are known to those services, completing health reviews, going to all the case conferences. And what we felt was important was to build that therapeutic relationship between one practitioner and the family and child, especially from children that are under youth offending or missing education and trying to see if there's any health need that we can identify to support the family to access the appropriate health advice in order to get the children back in school. Sorry, has that answered? It's fairly new. Um, I think what we're finding is she's getting very busy um incredibly so but what she does have a her part of her role is as our expert is she will upskill the rest of our school, school nursing staff and she's um a resource for us and all our you know the agencies we work with as well we will we're keeping an eye on her workload because she's really busy and like um Hanan said we can as we all know the pandemic has had a real impact on our young people so yeah that's where we are thank you yeah, and if I just um, ask, are you uh, planning on maybe expanding that and getting another member of staff as well? Or We're definitely considering it, and obviously we'll need to talk to our commissioners about that. But the, once we see the need, obviously we're monitoring it and we're, you know, collecting the data. And if we can see the benefits of it, then we will. I mean, the early findings is it's, you know, her role is really, really valued and it's also valued by our, the education staff that she's working with as well we get a lot of positive feedback so absolutely yeah okay um thank you um unless there are any any more questions i think this will be the last round of questions just because i'm conscious of what else we've got on the agenda so we'll just take one final round of questions um 
Let me first check whether there are any members online who have any questions before I go to members in the room. No? Okay. Um, members in the room with questions. Okay. Um, Councilor MacArthur, if you ask your question, and I've got one question to, to finish on as well. Thank, thank you. Um, table 3.3.5, obviously there is a big gaps, you know, nearly 40% of children are missing 12 months review, nearly 50% um, the 2.5 um, review. And are, people, are children picked up these checks? Are they picked up later? Um, and what does it mean in terms of what are the health implications of them missing uh, the checks at that age? Because as you say yourself, with the later um, table, you, you that feeds into the policies that you're making with regard to BMI. And also those are also obviously dropping, which is partly or presumably because of COVID. But I wondered what the health implications were and how you're checking up that these children are checked at some point and sorry just a quick second one um if you don't mind chair there's clearly the number of health visitors to cases appears to be way over what is recommended is that um a resource issue is that difficulty getting health visitors and what are the implications of that thank you uh just in terms of the the checks maybe um, Shelley Hanan so, so, so sorry, then, just before you, more? yeah, just before you ask that question, uh, could I just come in with uh, my last question, um, and then you can t take both questions together. Um, the question I had was around the re-procurement of the 0 to 19 services, um, and sort of the factors that are feeding into that uh, re-procurement, -re um, and I was just curious about um, um, your thinking on access to services by uh, children and young people, because one thing that came out of uh, my consultations uh, with children and young people when I was preparing this programme is quite a few uh, young people had questions around uh, being able to access services directly uh, th themselves uh, without having to go through their school or through um, a, a parent. Um, and so I'm just curious about your thinking around that um, as part of the uh, recommissioning process. Thanks. Thank you. Shelley, do you want to take the question on? Yeah. So there's a question about 12 months. Um, I'm just going I'm, I'm, I'm to pull it up. So probably it's be useful to, if we talk about what we do every month in terms of the 12 months review and, the, and our deep dives and how we then follow up on children. We, do you want to Anna's team does it again? Um, so each month, uh, first week of the month, we receive data for all the children that we haven't delivered a one or two year review. We will then go through every single clinical record to see what's happened, why we haven't seen them, and to ensure the process was followed. So what we introduced was an opt-out letter, opt-in letter, sorry. So once we try and contact them, contact the GP, we can't find the families, we email, because obviously COVID was great, we could get people's emails. Um, we then send a letter saying we've been trying to contact you. If you'd still like to have this review, please call us. That's shown some success, where one month we had seven families call. But the biggest um, percentage of families that don't receive the reviews because we've done everything to contact them and we can't contact them, or some say they've had it in nursery. We've got some that cancel, say we don't need it, we're happy with our child's development, but we'll always leave that um, communication open. We're here if you want to review in terms of our vulnerable families, they all receive a review. So every time I cleanse that data, there's never a vulnerable family within the 200 records that I look at every month or less, however many it is. Um, there are no vulnerable families in there. So I can confidently say those families are receiving a review and they, they're offered that review at home as well. So just to give a bit more assurance, um, if we have there are any concerns, like known safeguarding concerns or if there's been a really long gap um, between seeing this child because we have well baby clinics and things like that's so where mums will bring babies to see the health visitors we would follow up um, and we wouldn't close the case we would we would contact the GPs and what we find is about 20 percent of our families actually are mobile during that time um, and we'll they'll be living abroad or they'll just be out of the area so we never discharge them we keep them on the caseload so they, they can move back in so with, there's a process that we know we're not missing any children we also do the data again at 15 months I don't think that's on this table is it so and what you would see that is that figure would get higher so we'll collect the data again at, at 15 months 
sorry, just to come back, but the, with the 12 month review, it's 62.5 at the 2.5 year review, it's 53.2. So it's dropped. And also it's much, much lower than it was before COVID. Why is that? Because if it's, I mean, obviously things changed over COVID, but now it's post COVID. Why are the figures not going back up to sort of pre COVID levels? Just, just to say, I suppose when we're looking at 21, 22, we, we still had the impact of, of COVID um, at that time. Um, so obviously April 21 um, and started from kind of January 21, there were still lockdowns. There were still, um, you know, going through a third wave or something at that stage. So some of this data has been imp impacted by that. Um, but in terms of, I suppose, looking at more uh, recent information and, um, and in terms of how the services deliver, um, there are a lot more checks that the service do where it's it may have been done late. So although the performance is, say, you know, 53% or whatever percentage it is, um, the service is actually doing more checks than that. So so they are trying to kind of catch up with the ones that who may have missed in the last month or in the last uh, quarter. And obviously Shelley and, and Hanan have talked about how the, the vulnerable families are really, you know, make sure that they have had the checks and there's a kind of a, a review of that each month to make sure that that happens. So they are doing more than what this percentage says, but this is what, what is nationally reported. And this is how we can kind of try and benchmark ourselves against other areas. But, um, but yeah, but they are doing a lot more. No, no, I appreciate that. It's not a criticism. I just wondered, are you expecting the figures to go back to go back up now? If this was partly in COVID, would you expect the figures and the, the number of checks being done to be going higher going forward? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely hope that the percentages will um, slowly kind of increase and there's, there's more work that we're doing outside of our kind of contract monitoring meetings to look at how we can look at innovative ways of increasing that, working with perhaps our children's centres and, and others that have contact with, with families. But there is a little bit more kind of collaborative work that we're kind of planning around this to, to continue to improve it. Sorry, so the next question was around sorry, the case load. Oh, yes. Um, do, do you want to, want to start? In the oh. I was just going to say that um, I think that recommended case load is um, very challenging for all services. I'm not aware of, I'm, I'm involved in quite a lot of London um, networks around, around public health. I'm not aware of anybody that actually has that caseload level in practice. So I don't think um, Merton certainly aren't in a unique position. Um, I think, you know, we, the, the service have, uh, when they reviewed the, um, uh, the health visiting service, did try and look at a model where they, they looked at their active caseload and their wide caseload, um, which, which, you know, again, brought the, the active caseload closer, but still it, it, it is very different from that, um, uh, that, that 250. Um, there is no national kind of agreed you know standard that's set out in the um in the guidance for commissioners around that um so it, it is quite it is quite challenging but Shelley did you want to come in yeah and that's those figures are per health visitor that's per qualified health visitor what we've got we've got a health visiting team so with her she might have a nursery nurse that supports her she might have a staff nurse as well who's got been a trained additionally to support parents we've got an infant feeding nurse as well so it's it's a team effort so it wouldn't just be the health visitor who sees who sees them and then what clch have done recently as jude alluded to we've we've looked at because it's a national problem with and we because we and we um provide a lot a lot of health visiting across the boroughs we basically did a, a project called reimagining because we recognise that there are national issues. So we've looked at the whole health visiting model um, and the staffing. We've came, come up with what we consider to be a safe caseload number by looking at active and universal and um, looked at how our skill mix can support. So we have extended some of our roles and that's all being um, making sure that everyone's had the appropriate training and they've been quality assessed. So for instance, we do have staff nurses who will see some mums at home if it's like their second or third time to try and help manage those caseloads. And part of Hannah and my job is to make sure that we keep it safe. So we're constantly reviewing it because it is a challenge, but 
you know we we are constantly reviewing it and making sure that our health sisters don't have you know too high a targeted caseload because that's where most of the work is thank you is that okay should we move on to the next question okay thank you um and i think the the last question was around um but improving access more related to young young people and how they can kind of access. Um, I think this is something that's come through our service review or our rapid service review that we undertook and feedback from stakeholders and um, uh, school, whether that's schools, whether that's GPs, whether, you know, um, to say in terms of school nursing, the visibility, um, young people not knowing about the service, um, how they how they can um be more aware of the services, improving the visibility of, of, of services. So, I mean, these are all things that will feed into our kind of current in terms of what the our service, current services are doing, but also in terms of our future. So looking at what are the kind of innovative ways that, that um, young people can access our services. So, for example, I think we previously, and I don't know if it's come back online after um, COVID, um, but online um, uh, young people could ask questions uh, anonymously to the service and the service would would respond back to them um so just thinking really outside of the box and outside of what we've previously been doing to improve access and we'd you know we'll be looking at evidence and uh, best practice looking at what's happening in other areas that have kind of improved access for for young people but um Shelley Hanan do you want to yeah come I mean I'll people can self-refer so we encourage young people to self-refer we have drop-in clinics at the schools um, we have dropping clinics at our children's centres, so a young person can refer to our service. Um, parents can refer. We don't need a referral for a GP or anybody like that. So, and we have a single point contact, so you can just call up, and we'll yeah make sure that referral happens. Um, and we also have, like Helena says, we have Health Matters, which is a platform where children can ask questions anonymously um and we also have um you were mentioning yeah so we looked at this area in terms of where do we place our school nurse information the school nurse has said a lot of the information around the school nurse and access is by reception so i said maybe let's think about moving it away from reception because young people sometimes like to avoid adults as we know uh, and what we're looking at adding a qr code so they can just scan the qr on the poster and it will take them straight onto our website, Health Matters, where it's got, do you want to speak to someone? And this is what we offer, what advice and support. So what we've identified is maybe moving the poster away from main reception where the staff are to say, you know, the library or where the young people meet and put in a poster somewhere away from main reception. Um, yes, sorry, just just one final point. Just in relation, you talked about the the, the sort of uh, re-procurement process. I just wanted to say that we also have three public health young inspectors um, in our team, and they will be working with us again to to look at issues around around access and involvement of young people, and and uh, doing a great job for us. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I think those are all the questions. Um, and so all that's left is just to thank you for your time and for your uh, honest and uh, detailed um, answers as well. Um, and as we progress with uh, our agenda, um, please do feel free to, uh, to, to leave our meeting if you've got other things to be getting on with. Um, but um, it would be great if we could have you return at some point um, in the future to update us on that uh, re-procurement process and, um, um, and just an update on the overall service delivery as well. But thank you very much for this evening. We really appreciate your time. Okay, um, so now we'll move on to agenda item five, uh, childhood immunization in Merton. And for that, uh, we've got uh, Fiona White from NHS England, who's joining us online. Um, and so I'll hand over to Fiona for a brief introduction before we then move on to questions uh, on the report. So over to you, Fiona. Thank you for joining us. Yes, um, thank you very much for inviting me. So 
Um, I currently work as a nurse practitioner at uh, GP surgery and I have a role within the ICS for leading immunisation and work in par partnership with the London Borough of Merton and I'm here to speak um, as a representative of part of the partnership team. So um, just as an overview, so we're focusing on children's immunisation. So there's an expectation that we cover, uh, cover, we have a coverage rate of 95% um, for all children routine immunisations. And um, each area has roles and responsibilities. So the Department of Health and Social Care provides the national strategic um, oversight for vaccination policy in England. NHS England um, is responsible for commissioning the national uh, commissioning program for England under a sec section 7A agreement. And the UK Health Security Agency undertakes surveillance of vaccine preventable diseases and leads any response to outbreaks. The integrated care system, which is what I'm part of and work in primary care, has a duty of quality improvement and this extends to the primary medical care services. But we work um, across uh, the NHS in partnership with the local authority, the voluntary sector, community sector, um, and, and hope to improve uptake of immunisations uh, for all, and including reaching the unreserved areas and populations. So we work along uh, with everybody that's got a specific interest and there are new services that are being developed um, in the London uh, borough around children's hubs that we hope to have an impact and um, improve immunisation access. So um, we, we have got a uh, plan, we have got a South West London strategy for immunisations and Merton has a specific plan for um, immunisations uh, uh, as a borough, but we will be working in partnership. And the key focus around that plan is to improve preschool booster immunisations and um, the MMR, which is a key focus. We need to make sure that every contact counts in, in primary care or in any service so that we promote um, immunisation. And we know that historically, uh, there has been uh, a variance in immunisation coverage in Merton, uh, and we are doing our utmost to make sure that in primary care that the coding of immunisations for people who've come from abroad is corrected, which has a huge um, shift in, in uptake. We also make sure that any patient that has left the country or has moved to another area is removed um, from the system so we don't have any ghost patients, but we never remove patients that have uh, or deregister patients that have got any kind of safeguarding issues or family members have mental health issues. We make sure that there is a safe transition for those families. So um, with regards to um, uh, vaccinations, and you will see from the papers here, there's a huge range of, of vaccinations. There's um, the data that you've got in your pack is from July to September 2022, so that's quarter one. We've currently got quarter two data that I can't share with you because it's unpublished, but there is an improvement in there. Um, currently, from the data here, you will see that the six in one, the primary care dose at the age of two years is 91%, and the London average is 89%. And the uptake of the four in one preschool booster in Merton was 72% and the London average, average was 75%. Now uptake for MMR2 is slightly higher in Merton out of this cohort at 83% and London was 82%. And the uptake for MMR2, because there's two doses, one at a year and one at three years and four months, um, was currently 73% uh, and the London average was 75%. Now, we have got a page uh, on a plan. It doesn't only just cover children's immunizations, it also covers adult immunizations. We work with the maternity services to make sure that um, uh, babies uh, in utero are safe. So the mother has uh, the flu vaccine or the whooping cough vaccine, which is really, really important. 
and I lead the COVID vaccination service for Merton and have done since the start of the pandemic. And we are still delivering up to the 30th of June um, immunizations. So we have got one last clinic left this Sunday where children can attend and have their vaccine and so can adults. And that's at Wilson and all their care homes and house ban are currently being immunized. There is a programme currently for immunocompromised um, children that's going to be delivered in secondary care for the COVID vaccine. Um, we're just um, securing the final uh, agreements around sites um, and any other immunocompromised. And then, of course, the programme will be rolled over in September again around COVID. There is a key focus on inequalities and, and making sure that we target areas in the east of the borough where there's less uptake. And we did some work during the half term to try and improve access and increase the um, uptake. Uh, we're one of the few um, countries that don't make it mandatory for immunizations as a prerequisite to a school placement. So patients uh, and families have choice. And we have noticed during COVID that there is a bit of uh, reluctance and hesitancy around immunisation for children and parents and we have designed a questionnaire that's been sent out to all parents that are non-consenting so we will get some feedback as to why parents are choosing not to immunise their children. I'm um, happy to answer any questions that you may have um, around this paper. Um, thank you, Fiona. Um, we'll now move to questions. Um, can I first just check whether anyone online would ask any questions before I move to members in the chamber? Okay, no problem. Um, questions from the chamber. Um, we'll have uh, Councillor uh, Gold, uh, Councillor Willis-Croft and Councillor Hall. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the, the data for Merton is quite disappointing. Um, I see there's quite a lot of green arrows, but um, we're still um, behind. Um, I'm just wondering, the um, Local Government Association published a report in January 2020 about increasing the uptake for vaccinations and maximising the role of councils. Is that a report that's been taken on board um, locally in Merton? And um, are you following the advice there for um, increasing the uptake and especially for MMR2, which as you say, is, is particularly disappointing here? Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilscroft, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions, Chair. Um... The first one is uh, page uh, 32 about uh, opportunistic uh, immunization. I see that uh, uh, what's mentioned is Merton's GP services are um, put down as a uh, uh, opportunistic um, you know, place for immunizations, but hospitals are not mentioned here. I just wondered why Hospitals are not mentioned as an opportunistic place um, as well, you know? And my second question is um, about routine childhood immunizations. Is it possible to get data for uptake uh, in Merton schools about these routine childhood immunizations? That's all. And Councillor Gold. Thank you. We have to get this right. The immunisation levels are low in Merton for children. World Health Organisation states that vaccinations are one of the public health interventions that will have the greatest impact on the world's health. Vaccination is also one of the most cost effective public health, health interventions. Preschool boosters are of paramount importance. Is there a link between the early review we heard where lack of provision of health visitor 
contact in this cohort was uh, happening. We hear that the IT systems are failing at the same time we are failing our children. When will these issues be dealt with if every contact counts? World Health Organization recommendation for immunization is 95%. For Merton, five year preschool booster is 72.3%. Five year MMR2, 73.4%. They were low before COVID, they are still low. The challenges raised are administration issues, inconsistent reminder systems, data collection issues, and access to appointments. What steps are being taken to address these challenges? Thank you. Um, please go ahead and answer those questions, Fiona. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So with regard to the MMR issue, we have had a local hackathon around the MMR issue with an facilitated um, uh, the programme and we took on board all the recommendations that um, NHS England advised us around uh, the MMR. We are making sure that the MMR is offered either in the school nursing service, opportunistically um, in the GP practice, and we, we get lists of patients um, every month through the child health information system to tell us which children are missing their immunizations. We have to contact them every, uh, we have to contact them three times um, uh, throughout that, but usually it happens more times than that and offer it. But as I've said before, there are lots of parents that are choosing to um, deny consent for some immunizations, even primary, primary immunizations because of COVID. And also the data that you're looking at is never the same cohort of children for cover data because children are added on as they reach an age cohort and drop off it at the age of five. We also have lots of children that come from abroad that follow those schedules. And so they will be offered immunization, uh, but they often choose to um, follow their country's immunization, uh, immunization schedule or want to go back to their own country um, to have their child immunized. Uh, we do upload data when we get it and we chase every single child um, on a weekly basis. We have databases and we follow up those children. So we are doing the national recommendations for the MMR. With regard to opportunistic vaccines and hospitals aren't mentioned, they're not actually commissioned to give vaccines unless it's a health visitor, um, a midwife who will give pregnant women vaccines or for the COVID um, uh, vaccination for the immunocompromised. Um, in casualty, they will be given uh, a, a booster of tetanus, which is part of the six in one, if they have an injury and they're not up to date with their vaccine. And in some neonatal units where children spend a long time because they're preterm, they will be immunized within the hospital and that data comes back to uh, the clinical system. Um, so there are some immunizations, but it's not a routine um, issue. With regard to uh, preschool boosters and the health visiting um, service, so I think every, every contact does count and the health visiting service um, does have contact with um, mothers uh, when they're discharged from hospital after they've had their baby, they get routine information that's given around the immunizations that are due. They have a red book um, that uh, they're given with all the immunization schedules on there and they're given advice. They also have a local app where they are prompted to, to and reminded to have uh, their immunization. With regard to IT failings, um, we don't have the same problems because uh, we are given immunization data through CHIS and we're also, we have data transferred from record to record when people register and when somebody moves into the area, their records are, are, um, are updated. So we should have robust systems. We, we also, when patients come to our services in primary care to register, we um, don't let the children fully register until we are given all their immunization data and they're registered with an appointment 
to update all missing IMS. So that's been a proactive way of making sure that we um, capture data and that um, children are fully immunized. And most practices do actually do that. So every contact does count. There are pop-ups that come up um, on the corner of our screen to tell us that they're missing immunizations and every clinician um, is proactive in, in booking the appointment for the children uh, with the nurse uh, when they're seeing them. Um, and it could be in a week in advance um, um, so that they can um, um, immunize them. Um, the same uh, uh, patients are issued reminders um, uh, um, and sent text through something called AQRX to remind them to book an appointment. And we're also sending out a questionnaire for people who don't consent to immunizations um, to find out why they are declining and then we will build strategies in place to help that. I don't know if that answers all your questions. Oh, I think about the access issue. So there are some primary care networks that have additional appointments in the evening for children um, who want to um, access immunizations in early evenings. Um, so there is access and also at the weekends. Um, so there is access for nurse clinics. We used to have a, a federated model where we put on additional clinics uh, for um, the polio booster, but that has stopped now. It's just routine and um, immunization. So we are proactive as and when the demand is. I hope that answers your question. Um, you'll ask a follow-up question. Um, yeah, sure. Um, are there any other uh, panel members who would like to ask any questions? Okay, uh, then Councillor Charles and then Councillor Kirby. Uh, but first to you, Councillor Gould. Thank you. Uh, one of the other um, issues that were mentioned, the lack of awareness of the immunisation schedules. I'm just wondering whether that is mentioned at any of the antenatal checks or talks um, with the intervention um, along the programme, welcome letter or anything uh, uh, along the, the path um, so that the parents are aware, so they, they have that awareness beforehand. Thank you. You want me to answer that question now? Um, can we take the three questions first and, and then uh, you can respond to all three of them at once? Yeah. Um, Councillor Charles, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know if you felt that maybe the chemists and perhaps even the mosque uh, might have a role to play. Obviously, they did um, join the COVID pandemic. So maybe that, that, that might be an op another option as well. And Councillor Kirby, your question. To congratulate you for having, apart from those two arrows, everything else going in the up direction. So well done on that. I'm sure this is not an easy task, particularly with the anti-vax campaigns that went on through COVID. But I think when you think about vaccinations, you couldn't have had more focus on vaccinations than you did during that period. And I think a lot of minds did get changed. Um, I do think there's real concerns about some groups uh, and how they've been influenced. And it would be interesting to have some sort of, I'm not asking for it now, obviously, but some sort of breakdown of um, ethnic groups, particularly who might uh, be resistant um, to vaccination. And I say that because of um, local experience when we've had conversations about this um, and uh, what we can do as a local authority to um, promote uh, um, immunization what what you know what what advice would you give us that we could actually help with this uh, difficult situation I know from my local school we have a very very high turnover very very high turnover uh, and um, children coming in and going out all the time. So it must be, uh, I think in certain areas, it'd be very difficult to track, but any suggestions would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, thanks for those questions. Uh, now back to you, Fiona. Brilliant, okay. So 
the red book is a is a book a physical book that's given to every single new mother and every child has it with their immunization records on there and it's got pages in there that that um, highlights which immunization is um, eligible and when it's due so all parents are talked about um, about this book with a health visitor um, of when they've come out of hospital after having a new baby uh, and they tend to keep those red books as their reference. Um, as I said, there's also apps that um, maternity use and their immunization schedules are on there. And also schools send out information about um, immunizations when they're joining a school, they advise them to make sure that they're fully immunized. I have heard local dentists recently saying that um, they wouldn't register children unless they were fully immunized. Um, which I thought was very innovative uh, and parents are coming along and, and trying to get their children immunized even though they're over the age of five. So, um, and I think that's around the Hep B issue because hepatitis B is now part of the schedule. Uh, so that's really important. Um, so information is shared with parents and they, can, and they have timely information and antenatally and postnatally. With regard to chemists, that's a really good idea um, but currently they're doing adult things. So they do flu and they do um, COVID vaccinations. They, you need to have specific training for children's immunization. It's not just an online course. You have to have a two day course. You have to be assessed um, and um, make sure that you're competent and the changes in immunization uh, uh, do occur. So to keep that competence, um, you need to be doing them on a weekly basis chemists aren't commissioned to give them. They can give travel vaccines and some of the travel vaccines are part of the schedule for children. Uh, but I think they only do travel vaccines to adults, not to children. With regard to mosques, very interesting. I did a lot of work in mosques um, during the COVID season and we have been looking at trying to do some promotion work uh, with mosques and I've um, signposted um, some of the public, my public health colleagues into the contacts around doing immunization and promotion within the mosques. But generally, those groups, are, are, um, uh, their uptake is very high around immunizations, uh, but there could, could be further work. The other issue around the anti-vaxxers, yes, it saddens me um, greatly to, um, to know that there's a lot of misinformation out there that parents have. They're scared, they're worried, uh, we signpost them to the NHS website um, choices so that they can look at data, but they are still very concerned. And we still have got the legacy of Wakefield around um, MMR um, through grandparents um, uh, sharing that information to their children. So, but we are always dispelling myths. We are putting on webinars. We're encouraging um, the comms team to work together with parent groups um, and I've done loads of webinars not only about um, COVID vaccine but childhood immunization to different ethnic groups um, and to raise awareness so we are being really proactive uh, about how we can um, share information and I do share some of your concerns. We will with this questionnaire that we're sending out with non-consent it does have ethnicity as part of it so that information will be able to be shared with practices at practice level, PCN level, and at MRSA level, and maybe at some point in the future, if people can complete the questionnaire, although the uptake usually on questionnaires is quite low, we might have some intelligence that might influence how we can be proactive and influence our families to increase their uptake um, of in. I think we have got community champions and um, young people that are. Uh, involved and they share those messages and I think that's really really important so we will be working with public health uh, around influencing um, people like social prescribers to make sure that they have information I'm often talking to different groups uh, across the community about in so um, uh, so I'm happy to do that uh, and join any future uh, working groups that has got an immunization focus. I do attend the um, boroughs uh, hearing committee and uh, encourage all those children that have got 
clearing deficits to make sure that they're fully immunized because um, those that have cochlear implants need additional immunization to protect them against infection. So hopefully that um, answers your question. Um, so thank you, Fiona. Um, I think we'll have one last round of questions. Um, and uh, Billy, I saw your hand up. So Councillor Hayes, um, Councillor Hall, do you have a question? Okay, okay. And anyone else? Okay. Yeah, it, it follows on from one of my colleagues uh, behind me uh, uh, talked about the level of vaccination. I think you said 95, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I think it was 95% was quoted and Merton was at 72%. And I, I, I don't know if I've got that right, but I think that's what I recall. And the thing that struck me, uh, building on Councillor Kirby's uh, point about uh, uh, different groups. Now, I know the anti-vax movement is quite broad in some ways. but uh, So there's the, the anti-vax movement. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we've, all, we've all seen elements uh, uh, of that. But the other thing that strikes me is, is the ethic breakdown in terms of my suspicion is it comes from particular particular groups outside of the anti-vax movement per se. So my question is, uh, have we got any data on that where particular groups, I, I, I kind of think I know some of them, but have we got any data on, and so question one, you have any data on the groups? And it may be linked to the demographic of Merton as well. So have you got anything on that? Thank you, Fiona. Thanks very much. This is not so much a, a question, it's more a, a comment about um, on page 35, there's the adult immunisation programme. And I just wanted to make the comment, I don't understand why um, immunisation against shingles is only for 70 to 79 year olds. I had it at the age of 60, it was the most horrendous thing because painkillers don't work. Um, on it it's a very painful um, condition and I know you can't do anything about it so it's really just a just a comment you know I just wish they'd bring it down to say 55 or 60 thank you okay um, Fiona do you want to take those two questions as the last questions of the evening <laughs> yeah thank you very much right so the 95 percent is the World Health Organization target and uh, um, the reason for that target is because we have to have herd immunity. So we need to have high levels of immunization in order to protect the public. And we strive to reach those. And sometimes we reach 90% in the primary inns. The problem is the primary inns are before the age of a year. When and parents are very focused, they're at home because they're on maternity leave, then they go back to work. And the children at three years, four months, where they will have their preschool booster, the parents are back at work. So it's difficult for them to take time off. And also those children know exactly what we're going to do to them. And so um, they often are a bit reticent when they come into the GP surgery uh, around immunizations. So, you know, um, that's often a challenge. Um, some parents also only want to give one immunization at a time. And uh, we need to give more than one at a time, you know, three in one go. Um, but we are charged with making sure that we do give all their immunizations at every contact counts. So we try and encourage parents to have all their immunizations done in one go. Um, so that, that is a, um, a challenge. And yes, we have to work on um, our targets. Um, and I'm, uh, because I said that we have still got unpublished data that's slightly more improved. So I'm hoping that we'll have some encouragement next time around um, in cohort two. With regard to ethnic breakdown, there is in your paper um, the uptake and ethnicity um, broken down and award level. And, and yes, we do look, look at that. Um, there tends to be a trend within uh, Polish communities um, currently 
who want to wait till they go back to their own countries to immunize their children. There are some groups um, that uh, Afro-Caribbean groups that are, uh, don't want to immunize their children at all. And that's, I think, a legacy partly through COVID. But we have done webinars to try and understand what those issues are uh, around those groups. And we do ask the question, but currently they're kind of saying it's a private issue. We don't want to discuss it. And that's it. But we do contact them on a monthly basis and offer them in if they want to change their mind. Uh, and we will have to do some further work on that. And as I said, the questionnaire might give us some insight. The other issue around the shingle vaccine, I've got some really good news for you. So currently we have a, a live vaccine that's given to all clients uh, from the age of 77 to 79 and uh, a dead vaccine that's given to the same cohorts that are immunocompromised. From September, the age cohort is going to drop to 50 and it will be two doses uh, and the second dose has to be given between two months and six months in order for the GPs to get paid. And it will be the dead vaccine because the live vaccine has got some complications uh, with it if you're immunocompromised. It's much safer um, now to give a dead vaccine, but you do have to have two doses. And that will be rolled out from September. So I've asked all practices in Merton about eight weeks ago to try and call every single patient that's due their pneumococcal vaccine and their shingles vaccine to get it now um, if they're eligible. So they'll only need to have one vaccine um, because it's once in a lifetime. So there will be changes. And yes, shingles is a really horrid um, uh, condition, especially if you get it in your eyes or your face because it can cause blindness. So we are being really proactive. And we will work with the comms team around um, around the borough and South West London to promote uh, those immunisations. So I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And uh, I'm glad that uh, one of the questions was actually quite topical um, and, and in line with something that's about to be rolled out. Um, so um, yeah, for that uh, concludes um, the child immunization um, report and all that's left to say is just to echo um, Councillor Kirby's words on how even though the questions tonight have been uh, quite challenging um, we understand it is a difficult role uh, trying to increase those immunization numbers and trying to get us to that uh, World Health Organization target of 95% of and it's not just um, specific to Merton but it's something that's London, it's a London-wide challenge. Um, and so we, we, we understand the scale of the challenge and um, uh, we, uh, we back um, the, the work that uh, you do to try and uh, boost those numbers. Um, and so thank you very much for, um, uh, for taking our questions and for the report. And uh, we hope you have a lovely evening. Um, thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much for inviting me. I will, I will love you and leave you now. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Um, okay, we'll now move on to uh, the performance monitoring report. And before we go to questions, um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Maisie just to give us a quick update on the changes with the performance um, I I indicators, and then we'll go on to questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, this report comes regularly to this uh, scrutiny panel and provides a summary of performance information for the department. Um, this is the, as this is the first meeting of, of this financial year, um, we have um, in the department, we've reviewed um, the sort of provisional year end data and the latest benchmarking information um, so that we can kind of undertake a bit of a review of the targets um, and, and also kind of review the year end data that's available. Um, so that's the sort of big change for this um, this report that's come this time. Uh, the cover note that you um, have in your pack does um, sort of list all of the all of the target changes um, that are that are included. That's at paragraph two point eight. Um, 
And yeah, and there's also a selection of indicators that didn't previously have a target, but we, upon reviewing them, felt that um, it was perhaps helpful for a target to be included. So um, there are a couple of indicators that are evaluated for the first time. Um, as is usual uh, in this report, we also have uh, the list of exceptions, so the, the red and amber flag rated um, indicators that are, are flag rated red or amber against their target um, with some narrative about, about that. Um, so that's at paragraph uh, 2.1 in the cover note. Um, so I think as members are sort of familiar with the report, I won't go into any further detail. Thanks. Um, th thanks, Maisie. Um, now we'll uh, jump to any questions. Um, any questions from anyone online? No. Okay, um, Councillor MacArthur, uh, if you ask your question, and I've got one contribution to make as well. Thank you very much. Um, in regard to number 33, which is read the rate of proven reoffending, um, I was wondering what are the links to cuts and services of youth workers? <clears throat> I know we've asked for a, an update, Catch-22 update, and I don't know if that's going to be provided soon and whether you thought that that was any link. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask a question on... Um, uh, measuring sort of the impact of uh, that the rollout of the family hubs uh, will, will have and wh wh whether um, there are any indicators that we could look at for uh, for, for that rollout. Um, that, that's my question. Thank you. I'll hand over. Yeah, I'll hand over to James. <laughs> yes. So I'll just start off, and then and then and then David might have more to add on the um, reoffending rate. So, um, so I guess one of the things just to put in context is we have very small numbers of um, young people within the um, youth justice service. So, so we are, if you like, um, quite successful in preventing that offending in the first place. So it, it tends to be that those young people who come into the system will come in for um, offences which are more serious. Um, they're also because they're quite small numbers. Um, the percentages are therefore higher when they uh, when they do. But it is something that we are uh, really sort of um, focused on. I don't know that it would be around a, a link within cuts in youth services because of the reoffending once they're already in the system. Uh, but but clearly there is something about the continuing with that preventative measures to prevent young people coming into the. Uh, you know, into the youth justice system in the first place, because we know that once they they are, and particularly once they're coming in for quite serious offences, it's much more difficult to sort of you know prevent that that reoffending. David, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, I mean, nothing to really add on that. I mean, I I think the the, the rates and the small numbers have been consistent as as well. So um um you know, is is sort of any impact of any sort of austerity and caps I don't think we've seen but because our numbers historically have been so so small that was going to the catch 22 update do we know when that's going to I don't think we have um clarified yet in where it's going to come in the year but that was one of the things we obviously discussed in terms of scrutiny choice yeah if I may come in in terms of the family hubs um uh measures of impact um this being a uh, a central government program we've got some key indicators that we are being asked to meet uh, so what i would suggest is rather than adding it to these indicators um through our, our updates uh, through the um, um the departmental update we can talk about how well we are doing in terms of the rollout rollout in comparison with those indicators that have been set for us if that's okay well, that does work for me. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Gould, your question. Thank you. Uh, on um, 2.2.3, uh, referring to the school numbers, are there any likely school closures? So um, we brought our uh, pupil place planning strategy to this scrutiny panel last autumn, and we are proposing to bring an update to that, um, that, uh, that strategy. 
uh, again in the autumn term and our strategy is saying no we're not planning to do that uh, we're obviously working carefully with individual schools and uh, helping them to manage their budgets and uh, associated with their pupil numbers um thank you elizabeth um councillor hayes your question and so, sorry, Councillor Hayes, before you ask your question, um, is there anyone else who'd like to ask a question so we can get them in freeze? Uh, Councillor MacArthur, do you have your hand up? Okay, no, no, no problem. All right, uh, Councillor Hayes. Yeah, good, good that there's no closures, but you'll have seen the report in the Evening Standard about a month ago about London's demographics. Have we done any work on that? Uh, the, the, based on that. Mm -hmm. Demographics in regard of, of school. And uh, Councillor MacArthur. Yeah, sorry, just two quick ones. Um, number 26, the persistent absenteeism. Um, I know that indicator hasn't been reported. Is that going to be included as a regular on this, on this, um, in this <laughs> thing now? So, and also 3.3, I'm really pleased to see um, the the that the monitoring performance registered care experience young people is going to be is going to be bought uh, do we know following the council's motion passing whether care experience is now included in the eias thank you yeah can i echo that as well i was really glad to see that in, included as an indicator um elizabeth would you have to say those questions yes so um Yes, that report in the Evening Standard was a very interesting read. It's um, it's something that we have all, all we've been aware of from for some time. So we received GLA projections data around um, uh, the number of pupils that would be expecting in our schools, and we uh, look at that data in the context of our own understanding of the local communities um, uh, to uh, project where we are looking um, uh, uh, that there may be um, uh, pupil role fall. Um, so that's why we have created our pupil place planning strategy, why we are continuing to look at that on an annual basis and in between time working actively with schools uh, to help uh, manage um, the, the falling roles that we are experiencing as other local authorities are in the primary phase. So there's a lot of work going on about that at a strategic but also an individual school level. Thanks for that. That's that's good news. Obviously, keeping schools open is good. But I'm aware that um, Lew not Lewisham, um, Southwark, I think they're closing schools, aren't they? And so, is there any kind of good that you know what, what what's happening with schools? Understand the pressure on falling roles. Mm -hmm. Is there any red flags for us as mates in regards to the tension that must will it start to arise? I think. As, as as we're affected by foreign roles as well thank you so to come come uh, to respond to that part of the question um um we are already um i wouldn't call them red flags but because we are looking at on a school by school basis um uh where we've got those falling roles the impact on school budgets uh because if you haven't got a full two form entry you haven't got uh, you know 60 children with the income they bring um, is not the same as having 40 or 45 children in a year group. So um, uh, I wouldn't call them red flags, but working really closely with a number of our schools to help them manage those challenges. Um, and then in terms of the persistent absence um, indicator, um, that will certainly be uh, regularly coming back. Um, and I think we said in terms of the scrutiny topic planning that there would be some update, uh, uh, updates around uh, attendance coming back regularly. So not just that figure, but wider work and impact of that. Can I just add on that one? So, so part of the problem we've got with that indicator is that the national, um, the national data that we have that schools are providing via WAND is not very reliable. Not all schools are using it and the comparators are not. Um, are not, um, I suppose, uh, completely accurate either. So, so it's it's getting it so that it's right, so that you've got the right data that you can look that, that you can look at, rather than data that we're. Uh, I guess we're we're sort of getting it back and questioning whether it's right. And the DfE themselves know that. I mean, really, ideally, you'd have a hundred percent of schools using the same system, and then you really would know um, how you use those comparators. So, so I think across London and also nationally, it's a bit of an issue in terms of getting that that right at the moment, but.
Um, uh, yes, I was, we, we haven't considered it, but I think it's a very good suggestion. I think we'll take it away and consider whether we should do that in fact, quality access. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think there are any other questions. Um, and so we will leave that agenda item there um, and uh, move on to um, our first task group uh, to, to report back. Um, but before I hand over to uh, Councillor Kirby to introduce her task group findings and recommendations, um, can I just say um, on behalf of the panel just how much we appreciate um, all the time and effort that um, you've put into this task group and Councillors Hall and MacArthur have also um, uh, put into um, gathering this research uh, on a really sensitive area um, and speaking to all the people and stakeholders um, uh, involved in this um, and compiling it in what I thought was a um, uh, well-written and easy-to-follow report. Um, and I particularly found the case studies to be quite uh, powerful as well. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, other members of the panel will agree. Um, but I will stop there um, and uh, hand over to, to you, Councillor Kirby and Councillors Hall and MacArthur, uh, to introduce your findings and recommendations uh, before we uh, offer our reflections on it as a, a panel. So over to you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, actually, it was an interesting piece of research to do, so it wasn't a chore. Um, I'm very glad we took it up because I think one of the things that we all felt strongly about was how are young people here being supported? Um, and so that so our terms of reference, which was to throw a light on the level of self-harm and eating disorders in young people in Merton with the aim of improving support and preventative action, investigate the prevalence of these two things, identify the good practice and preventative action, and then report back. Um, I'm sorry it took a while to do it, but it's just one of those things I think. <laughs> You felt like you were nearly there and then you weren't. Um, I think one of the things that came across from uh, our research was that um, there is a lot of good support going on in, the, in Merton for young people. And I think that was very reassuring. We also found that there was a lot of information, good apps, good organisations like STEM uh, and Off the Record and the ones that we've um, included in here who provide an enormous amount of information and they've done amazing research uh, that um, on the preventative side of things um, is very reassuring. So um, we put together a series of recommendations from our findings, um, but because we um, are not regular putting a task groups together, um, we're happy to um, discuss those recommendations and who we've got down as personal responsible for them at, at tonight. So if I just was to go through each one, if that's okay. Yeah. So the first one, understanding how widespread the problem is in Merton, not just those at the high end. I think that uh, on the I thrive, when you get to the serious ones, then there's evidence there of what's going on. And I think off the record has got quite a lot of information as well. But I think what we felt was there's a lot of young people struggling um, that aren't we're not we don't know how many of those how many of those are. are, are. And I think that was a worry for us. Um, it's, it would be good to know how prevalent the issue is because it it feels like a lot's going on but we're anxious that there might be a huge number in that background there who are probably um struggling um and we put down mental health forum and uh cams i know that we were very it was very impressive the mental health forum i have to say having all the schools come together knowing that each school has got a team there to back them up uh, that they meet regularly, they've got a chance to um, discuss what issues they've got and share good practice and and be willing to take training as well. I thought it was very it was very sound. So we we reference mental health forum and CAMS for that. And if that sounds reasonable, does that sound reasonable for that particular one? 
Yeah. Uh, young people cannot be left on the waiting list. Well, the um, CAMS referral numbers. So, so, sorry, uh, Councillor, yeah. but just to pause for a moment. Um, I think uh, Elizabeth wanted to, to comment on that question. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. And apologies, Councillor Kirby, I wasn't quick enough off the mark. Um, I, I think probably what would be helpful with some of the names on, on here, um, it may be applicable for all of these, if we just need to go back into the system and just check where we, how we can best gather this data uh, and where it, it, it could perhaps sit. So perhaps rather than respond to each one on a, 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 by each point, um, is to take those back and actually have that discussion with 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 partners in particular, because we're obviously um, um, identifying uh, non-council colleagues as well. Um, so, if that is okay, thank you. A bit at members about it. Um, um, the recommendation to put them they they were happy with our recommendation. So yeah, we're very happy for that to happen. Um, I would just say. Um, the case studies were powerful uh, and then when you actually go through an individual's uh, problems with them um, it, I found it really quite moving the whole thing um, and I do think understanding those kind of things um, and having more case studies is really powerful um, in, in the same way as the report we had earlier on it does really kind of bring it bring it uh, down to earth um, I think that um, it would be lovely if Jill and Samantha could actually have a chance to say what they felt about the um, task group. But just to sort of summarize, really, I think um, there's a lot of stuff available. Uh, the council is doing a lot. The schools are doing a lot. Um, the community out there could do more if they knew what was available. And I think we would really like to make sure that there's widespread engagement with the local community about these issues because it affects so many young people yeah i uh, couldn't agree more um and thank you for that, that introduction um and i think the panel would also benefit from hearing from councillor hall and councillor MacArthur on um their thoughts on the final recommendations and and report thank you chen um very, um, very grateful to Councillor Linda Kirby for sort of leading us in this and uh, writing uh, a lot of the report. It's it was staggering. Um, I, I agree. The case studies were extremely uh, moving and very useful. And I don't know if anybody gets the Times. Obviously, I don't because it's a Murdoch thing. But um, online, uh, there's a story in there today. That actually uh, the headline is self-harm and eating disorders among teenage girls soar since COVID. And social media and self-isolation have contributed to a staggering rise in cases. Um, they're talking about um, the eating disorders such as anorexia and bulimia amongst girls aged 13 to 16, 42% higher than would be expected based on pre-pandemic trends. Levels above among girls aged 17 to 19, 32 percent higher. It really is um, a very topical subject and one that we've got to tackle. And as Linda said, um, preventative measures obviously are the best. And just raising awareness uh, is so important. And uh, I think the the recommendations we've made, um, we've just got to keep on top of this and keep looking at it and doing whatever we can to help. Um, and it's not just girls, obviously, boys suffer from it as well. Um, but we've, re you know, it's, I'm so glad I was part of this uh, group because it's such an important subject. And um, yeah, just thanks very much to co-members, Samantha and, uh, and Linda for um, helping. It was a, I don't know, it was a good experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll keep it very brief. Firstly, thanks to Councillor Kirby. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Councillor Hall and I haven't been on a task group before, um, and Councillor Kirby really, really helped. It was really helpful and really led um, and showed us what to do, and it was brilliant. I think it's such an important subject. Um, I think there are so many underlying issues that people don't know about, um, 
I think the case studies helped to clarify two things for me. One was that so much of it is hidden and it's very easy to hide and young people often want to hide those issues. And so it's very important that we know what to look out for, for teachers um, and parents and everybody so that we can try and pick it up as early as possible. Um, the second was that parents need help um, because they are on the front line dealing with these issues and they often don't know what to do and there isn't a right answer different children will need young people will need different help so it's very important that they have access to support um, so that they can support the young people um, and finally the fact that at the um, young people are often need different help and often when they get to the final sort of when they get to cams when it's really bad they only get offered one sort of help and if they have the opportunity to go private that's fine but that, that opportunity to have different help should be available to all young people who, who um, are in desperate need of help. So those were the three things that I took from the case studies, but I just think it's such an important issue and I'm really pleased that we looked at it. Um, it's a huge issue. I think we could you could look at it for a year, more than a year and still not um, have covered even a bit of it, but I hope that this will help and I hope the recommendations will be taken up. Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, I, I think even with the limited time that you had to look at this, you were able to produce um, quite a full and in informative report, I, I found. Um, and so more credit to you for putting this together in a, a short space of time. Um, now, I'm going to open it up to any other panel members um, who would like to offer any reflections on what's in the report, on the recommendations, uh, before we uh, make a determination as a panel um, as to whether we want to move forward with uh, the, these findings and take this report into the, the next stage. So are there any, any comments or feedback from other panel members? Okay. Um, is the panel... Does the panel agree that uh, with the recommendation, with the recommendations in this report, um, and uh, agree to take these recommendations uh, forward to to cabinet? Yes. Well, once they've been, yeah. Uh, well, once they've been, it's been put into a final draft. Um, is it agreed? Agreed. Brilliant. At the, sure. the, when uh, I think when um, the previous scrutiny panel uh, looked at young people's mental health issues, uh, we picked up the recommendations and it was very impressive that they were addressed. And, and I think that bodes well for this. Yeah, that, 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 that's good to hear. Um, and also as a next step, uh, now that we've agreed as a panel that we want to move forward of these recommendations, will be to go back and uh, review them, to put them into a final draft that we then present to um, Cabinet. And then with their approval, uh, we will then uh, look at um, uh, how we're going to monitor these recommendations and when to uh, receive feedback on the recommendations that have been made uh, so that the panel can see what's actually resulted um, for, for, from this um, task group. Um, and so that's what's going to happen next um, with, with this um, report. Um, and once more, just a massive thank you to, uh, to, to you three councillors um, for, for what you've done uh, on such an important issue and such a really sensitive issue as well. Um, even though the numbers of children affected in Merton might not be as significant as, say, other issues, the impact it has on those individual young people is significant. Um, and so um, I'm hopeful that this report can make a difference to those, um, to, to those young people. Um, now, before we move on, were there, yeah. there were two comments. Um, Jane, do you want to go first and then yeah, Councillor Hayes? I just thought it would be worth us just going away and having a little bit of think about the communication. Because I guess it will be very different communication for parents than it might be for some of our young people. Um, so, so I think perhaps think with our young inspectors participation team about the best way to communicate with young people to raise those issues and the best sort of platforms to do that. 
um, and then also sync with our sort of communication team. I think that's absolutely right about how we might get those messages across and with our partners about where we might um, share those if there's sort of, um, you know, because posters and um, information in places, in, in libraries and in um, uh, centres where people go might be helpful to, to link into the advice that's there. Because as you say, there is lots of advice and support. It's just about making sure people know where to go to access that. Um, and on that, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Marky, but um, <laughs> so if, if, if you've got nothing further to add, that's absolutely fine. But I just thought it'd be a good opportunity to ask whether uh, what your thoughts are on, on, on that suggestion and whether you'd like to be involved in that discussion. Thank you. Um, I'll definitely want to get involved for sure. Um, in terms of uh, getting involved young people, I, I strongly agree with that because obviously in a lot of uh, com uh, communication with young people, they uh, they express their feeling that they want to get involved into decision making. They want to be accountable and what, uh, because from the young person prospect, uh, yes, we do an amazing job to ensure uh, that everything is in place, but is it the everything that we provide and is it um, tailored to the needs of the young people or do we need a different approach in order to make sure that everyone is supported dependent on their needs and um, what they want at that specific time. So I believe, I really strongly believe that uh, getting involved young people and children is really important. And in order to get to the point to fully support young people. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, couldn't agree more. Um, and um, it starts off by being involved in those early discussions rather than when something's been you know rolled out um and so i'm glad that with something like that you're happy to, to be involved in sort of those early discussions of how we roll um th those advertisements out and um how, how we make sure it's communicated in a way that resonates um and getting other young inspectors or other young people involved uh, would be great as well um thank you Maraki. um Councillor Hayes, your comment, and then we'll move on after that. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like it recorded in a minute, if people agree. It's a very good example of cross-party work. And that's new con not too controversial a thing to say. Um, and, you know, all credit to the, the working group. Um, Stella is writing that down in a minute, so right now. <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, now we'll move on to the departmental updates um, and I will hand over to, to Jane for uh, just a quick introduction uh, before we move to any questions or comments. Yes, I won't, you know, I won't do a long introduction, Chair. I just, um, I just think it, I, I wanted to sort of flag, I think, and it's in the sort of first paragraph, but I really wanted to welcome David to his new role, um, uh, his first meeting with us in his new role um, as, as interim uh, assistant director. So really good opportunity. Um, and actually it's offered an opportunity for a number of staff within um, children's social care and youth inclusion. So you'll see that we have a, um, one of our heads of service has moved across permanently to a different head of service role. Um, uh, Teresa Hills is acting up in, in David's role. And we've also got one of our service managers. Uh, we've done an external um, advertisement and um, uh, and she has been promoted to a head of service post. So it feels like although we've got quite a bit of change, um, uh, quite a lot of that is held in, in staff who've been with us for a while and have had the opportunity to either um, step aside and uh, step to one side and sort of expand their experience and others who've been able to sort of step up. So um, so really pleased um, with, with those um, arrangements. Um, so I just, uh, in case people were interested, so we, we just had an absolutely, we didn't win, I'm afraid, but we did have an absolutely lovely really? time. <laughs> we had a lovely time at, at the uh, awards, really good to be able to go and uh, celebrate Merton and, um, uh, uh, and be uh, for, that, for those awards. 
um, and we were uh, uh, were able to take um, uh, some of our young inspectors with us. Unfortunately, one of them wasn't well and able to come, but uh, one of our other young inspectors came with us, and both cabinet members. And it was a uh, 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 really good to see um, lots of really good work in local government being um, celebrated. So, um, so maybe better luck next time. But but anyway, we had a really good time. That's probably all I want to. Um, thank, thank you, Jane. Um, like we said at the last meeting, the being nominated, um, it was also a significant thing out of all the other local authorities um, and uh, for you to get that individual nomination as well. Um, and so that is a, a win in itself. We'll take that. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome to, to your new role, David. Um, okay, so uh, we'll move on to questions just because I know time is uh, ticking on. Um, and so, um, do any members have any questions on the departmental update? Uh, there is quite a lot in this departmental update, and some of it was a result of uh, the work program uh, discussion. Um, and so, I, I hope members have uh, have questions. Sorry. Okay, um, Councillor Gold, um, Councillor Hall, and do we have a third question? <laughs> Councillor McArthur. Uh, paragraph 2.2.2.29. The analyst showed emerging themes around contextual safeguarding and exclusion of girls. Which were what and what is being done to address this? Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm referring to paragraph 227, um, which uh, says that uh, there's a recognition that more needs to be done for children in special schools. I was just wondering what's been identified as you know, the, the solution. What what are you planning to do, um, especially for children in special schools? Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Hall, just the question I was going to ask, right. Um, it's to do with the universal free school meals for primary school children. Um, I'm aware that some schools, obviously it's a great thing, have, have said there might be problems um, because of uh, finance and also um, uh, trying to work. And so Merton apparently said they had some concerns about capital funding because of some small kitchens. I just wondered if you were quite happy that it's going to be fine when it's all rolled out in September. Um, so uh, to come to those uh, questions, and I might just need clarity about the second one around special, uh, Councillor Hall, the one around special school, but um, exclusions and 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 uh, um, uh, and girls. So um, we've had um, a really good meeting with our secondary school head teachers, um, where we've uh, gone into some detail around these these issues, uh, and uh, they too separately without. Uh, well, not with with data, but um, uh, we have also come to the uh, conclusion that we need to do some more work with girls. So at the moment, we don't have any specifics there that we want to be able to pick up on. Uh, but um, I'm actually meeting with secondary um, head teachers tomorrow morning, and we're going to take that conversation further. So I'll be able to talk about that more in more detail um, uh, in, in in a future meeting. And Councillor Hall, sorry, could you just clarify again the which which part of the report in terms of uh, children in special schools that you were referring to. Um, it, it's it's uh, point two two seven on um, school attendance yes. and focusing on children. Well, special schools. Yeah. So apologies for that. I was too busy <laughs> thinking about the previous question. Um, so um, uh, work well. So this is this is a, a very sort of bespoke package of support and working with our special schools um, to look at the um, issues that um, uh, the children in those schools are facing. Um, You'd be unsurprised, I'm sure, to hear that um, a, a number of those issues are are based around emotionally based school avoidance um, and the impact of the pandemic. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so work with those individual schools, work around individual young people, um, uh, and and really sort of. Um, 
work, working on a very bespoke level is what I would say. So free school meals. <laughs> so, in t so, so, so as it's a one year funding in first instance, we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't, we're not going to be undertaking any capital. Um, for it. So, so it would be working across kitchens. If it's a small kitchen, it might be that some of that will be supported by a nearby school with a larger kitchen. So when we're, we're not anticipating there being an issue with the rollout of it, um, I think that's partly because we have a lot of our schools are part of a, a sort of centrally coordinated catering contract. And so that that has made that easier working with uh, the contractor. So at the moment, we're hopeful it should it be fine in September. May not be a question. Okay, um, f thank you for those um, responses. Um, uh, do you have a, another round of questions? Okay, um, Councillor Charles, uh, Councillor Gould, and then uh, I have a, a question. Oh, and uh, uh, Ros as well, if you, if you want to come in with a third question. Um, so, Councillor Charles. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask a, a question. It's a, really, it's a supplementary question in a way about the uh, special schools. I was really interested to see that three of the special schools took part in the Beat, Beat the Street, which was really popular. And obviously, we're the borough of sport now. So I was just wondering what more initiatives can be taken to make um, sport more inclusive for the, the people that attend the special schools? And uh, uh, Councillor Gould, your question. Uh, 2.44, uh, with uh, reference to the dependency on high cost independent schools remaining a significant issue. Are there plans for another additional special school? I've heard maybe in Morden Park. Is that a possibility? Thank you. And uh, Rose, would you like to ask your question? Thank you. This was to do with um, school inspections and just really wanting to gauge how heads and schools have responded. Obviously, the terrible news uh, regarding Ruth Perry and what Merton is doing to support schools to make sure heads don't feel isolated. Um, thank you, Roz. Uh, over to you, Elizabeth. So um, uh, the inclusive inclusivity of sport in our special schools and, 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 and more opportunities there. Um, I, I think I would want to say that this is a, a absolutely the top of everything that we are thinking about in terms of the borough of sport. And I would want to mention two things that we are uh, that are happening. First of all, the Merton School Sports Partnership, which works with schools across the borough, um, uh, uh, is uh, planning for, um, has planned and will continue to plan for events and competitions that ensure that our children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities have the opportunity to participate in, in, in events um, uh, um, uh, amongst themselves, but also um, uh, across schools uh, further abroad. Um, I would also want to just uh, say that um, in terms of our special schools, as you know, Two of them are outstanding, Persaid and Cricket Green. And so the work that they do as outstanding schools um, uh, to, uh, to, to in in increase the opportunities for children and young people, they are there. And I know that they will continue to look at those. Thank you. Um, and shall I just uh, come to the wellbeing for heads and then come back to you, Jane, in terms of the special school plans? Um, Ros, thank you very much for that question. Um, absolutely at the top of our agenda as well. Um, when the uh, the news emerged about the very tragic death of Ruth Perry, um, head teacher of a primary school um, near Reading, um, this was a, a topic of conversation uh, that was significantly discussed at our uh, strategic head teacher forums. Um, so we do in Merton have very good and strong relationships with our head teachers. So we were very pleased that actually that rose straight to the top of the agenda and we were able to talk about it immediately. Those um, forums for head teachers are, are and will continue to be very important forums where this, this issue will be addressed. 
There are sp more specifically some um, uh, activity uh, that we are undertaking. So for our new head teachers, um, we've got a package of support in place, which includes mentoring, coaching, a strong package of CPD. So for our new head teachers, you know, when they come into this role, it's, it's, it's a big step up from deputy head to head. Um, and so we've got to really pay particular attention to those. Um, but I would also want to say that as a local authority, um, we are reaching out to all of our head teachers. So above and beyond our, uh, our school improvement strategy, um, our uh, senior, senior officers from across the education and early health division are, are, are putting our meeting. We're gradually getting around to all our head teachers to have well-being visits and conversations. So special school provision. So in terms of that that plan but to reduce the reliance on the independent sector, it's got several bits to it. So so, so Watley Avenue obviously is a, an annex of one of our existing um, uh, special schools, Melrose. Um, we've expanded the additionally resourced provision. We have a plan to expand uh, Persaid further. So, so definitely building on the provision we've already got. And then as part of our safety valve plan, um, uh, the opportunity for 120 place new special school but that is a free school so that that process is led by the dfe because it's a free school um and, and they and the site for that school has not been finalized yet it's obviously quite difficult finding an appropriate site but uh, for quite what is quite a large school and needs you know quite a um, a specific bit of land so we're still working on that with the but the dfe lead on that um because they they will have to you know finance and the, the building and the purchasing of the site so thank you um are there any any other questions on the departmental update before we move on Okay, um, so just to end on um, this note, um, what I found reading this departmental update is there were quite a lot of positive indicators, um, like the impact of uh, Beat the Street um, and uh, parents and uh, uh, students uh, being given their sort of first or second or third preference in, in um, schools. Uh, those percentages uh, looking uh, very good. Um, and um, also um, looking at sort of how we support our most vulnerable young people. Um, I um, was uh, particularly pleased with uh, uh, Corporate Parenting Board uh, signing off a pledge to support uh, children sort of seeking asylum um, and supporting them with sort of the legal uh, uh, pr process for that as well. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we should be doing what we can to support all of our young people and seeing something like that in the departmental update, um, especially uh, the day after World uh, Refugee Day as well, um, uh, is, is, a, is a really positive step. Um, so thank you for uh, the update. And with that, we'll move on to the last agenda item, uh, which is the work programme. Uh, which isn't a longer agenda item, uh, just to update everyone that um, we, um, uh, we, we've uh, selected the, the topics uh, for the work program, uh, which uh, you've seen in your reports, uh, which were all based on feedback and consultations uh, that we've done with uh, community groups, residents, um, uh, school heads, um uh, uh local um adventure parks um and the work program we've put together has been based on their priorities and uh the areas that uh, they think uh, we should be focusing on um as a panel um and on that i'd just like to thank again you know stella elizabeth uh Sukpao, uh toby as well um for helping to organize um those uh those meetings um and so i feel we've got a good work program um with a variety of areas to look at uh for, for the rest of this year um and i will also be looking to include some site visits um and having sort of service users come and sort of feedback uh, to, to the panel as well um, as a way of us assessing um, some of these um, areas as well. Um, so 
I hope everyone's had a uh, time to look over the work program. Um, and if there are any sort of questions or any uh, contributions, I'm just going to open it up uh, for that. Uh, Councillor Kirby. I'm really sorry I missed the discussion around this, um, but I, I know you've got your work program there, but would it be possible um, to include, I'm very happy to do it, is, is to um, have a task group around female genital mutilation? I don't think there's been a prosecution recently, is there? I can't believe in the number of schools that we've got in this borough and the number, number of young women that there aren't a, a, children in our schools who've been mutilated. I just can't believe it. When I was teaching in Wandsworth, I had on a Friday morning, um, a group of Somali women uh, would come in and the whole purpose of it really was for us to... Uh, share what procedures there were in the school with them and then to sort of embrace their culture so it's to make them feel welcome but then also to let them know what was going on in the school so we would do things like behavior management program and stuff like that and one um, the woman who was our interpreter she said to me ask them about female genital mutilation Linda and I did and all 14 women around the table had been mutilated and they we had a discussion around it, and they all said that it was cultural for them to have at least four children, otherwise they were, were, were seen as kind of failing the system, really. But none of them would, would want their children to go through that. And it, it is there. It's out there in our society. We have a, a, a number of children from communities where this is condoned. And it is illegal in this country, but I don't think we've had any prosecutions that I'm aware of. Um, and I would really be interested to find out, um, you know, what's going on, what what schools are doing, what research is is happening with this. So um, obviously, I'm happy to to do the work the work on it. So I'm not asking anyone to pitch it if, unless they want to. But I just think it's a really important issue. I mean, it's it's a it's it's taboo, and it's it's happening. Um, f thank you, Councillor, and uh, I think you've proven that uh, you you are capable of sort of t t taking on a, a a task group and delivering on it. Um, it's it's something that we can take away and um uh think about sort of what is the best way to look into that and what the situation is in in Merton and uh, whether it is an area that would benefit from closer scrutiny uh, whether that's in the form of a task group or an update uh, what, what whatever form it takes um but it's something that I've noted down and we will go away and 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 look at and um um we'll in involve you in that as well um if you know if we, we do decide to sort of take it forward as part of the work program. Um, but um, for, thank you for uh, bringing it up. It, it is an important issue. Um, and uh, I can't say that I know what the picture looks like in, in, in Merton. Um, and then so um, it's probably an area that might be worth considering. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, are there any other comments, uh, Councillor Hayes? It's not on the work program. I have raised this. Uh, with the cabinet member responsible but just want to just throw it out into this forum and not for any particular activity at the moment i think we should look towards at some point in the future one celebrating teachers how we do that is obviously a matter for discussion and thought because teachers certainly for the last 30 years of my life have been kicked around something rotten and i'm not talking about their pay claim or anything like that I'm talking about teachers because my kids went to Wimbledon College and Ace Line. And I know this is going to sound soggy and sentimental. Every time I came out of there, I was always well impressed with the kids. The kids and the, par the parents, and the, but the teachers in particular. The other thing, again, just to the, I mean, I've raised this uh, with the cabinet member, but just something to think about. Why we don't have a governor's network? Because I'm, I'm a governor in Gorringe, and I I'm still learning, but I would really like to share, you know, and that sounds a bit hippie-ish, but like to share fellow experiences 
So just to put that out there for now, Chair, um, you know, and I'm, you know, it's something I think we should be doing. The, the work that governors do, you get your pack and all like that, and I think it's invaluable. And the, some kind of men should be, we champion lots of things, but then people who turn out, you know, turn our kids into citizens, I think they need to be recognised at some point in the future. Thank you. Um, f thank you, Councillor Hayes. Um, I've made a, a note of those two things as well. Um, anything else? N nothing from people online? Okay. Okay, um, so I, I take it other than those contributions, uh, the work programme that we've currently put together is agreed. Okay, good, good, good. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, Stella and myself will, will go away and um, we will look at scheduling sort of the topics in the current work programme into our upcoming meetings and in between meetings where necessary. Um, and uh, we will also take away the contributions uh, from tonight's uh, panel as well. And um, um, uh, sort of feedback um, as and when topics on the work programme come up. Um, so that concludes the work programme. And before everyone packs away, um, I just wanted to end on one last um, announcement, um, and that is, um, I'm sure some of you in the room will already be aware, but uh, this is uh, Stella's last uh, panel. Um, and so I just wanted to say, well, one of the things about having such a, a talented screening officer is other, other employers want to take her away. Um, and so I, I could not have ended uh, tonight's panel uh, without recognizing um, Stella and all the work that um, she's done, uh, not just, you know, uh, during the time I've been a counsellor, but all the years that um, she's uh, served with us. Um, and I'm sure um, everyone in the room uh, will agree that uh, uh, we we do wish you well with the with, with new role, um, but uh, we, we are sad to, to know that uh, you, you'll be le leaving us soon. But um, I want to thank you for um, all the support uh, you've given me since I started um, and all the support you've given uh, colleagues around the room, uh, your uh, fellow um, co colleagues as well. Um, and uh, we're sure you're going to do really well in your new role. And um, please do uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're very